You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey vet rehabbers, now Gracilis muscle contractures are one of those frustrating cases to treat. You think you're getting somewhere and seeing improvement and suddenly you are back to where you started. Andrew Armitage from Greenside Veterinary Clinic in the region of the Scottish Borders is a vet that chats to me about using regenerative therapies together with rehab to treat these tricky musculoskeletal cases. He tells us of the story of the case that he first used it in, how amazed he was with the results that he got and how that dog was able to restore its function back to competing in hunting trials. He gathered all the stats that he had from all the cases that he treated and he decided to get his results published and peer-reviewed. Well, after this chat, I am sold on trying this as a treatment for any of my cases should I see any gracilis muscle contractures in the future. Before we head over to the interview, I want to say a big thank you to Sarah Marlowe from at Stretch and Flex Vet Physio. Love the name, Sarah. Thank you for the shout out about the Vet Me Rehabilitation Podcast on Instagram. Please email me on megatonlinepetout.com for your limited edition Vet Me Rehabilitation Mug. We have the current webinars and our free limited access membership. They are Diagnosis and Non-Surgical Management of Digit Injuries in Dogs by Jennifer Brown, Gait Assessment for Canine Hydrotherapy Patients by Amy Kings, and How TAC Influences Movement by Lauren Birkbeck. Now, you guys can log into the free limited access membership. You can watch the webinar and with the click of a button, download your CE or CPD certificate. I'd love you to take a screenshot, tag or add on on Pet Health. Sharing with your audience that you are learning and growing increases your credibility. It makes your clients feel that you're on top of your game and that their pets or horses are getting the latest up-to-date treatments. So let's hear about regenerative therapies with Andrew Armitage. Hey, Andrew, thank you so much for joining me. Hi there. Pleased to be uh, joining you today. Talk about, uh, yeah, quite a challenging subject, hopefully. Yeah, I'm super excited. We're going to be chatting about regenerative medicine and gracilis contractures. Before we get dive into that, though, Andrew, won't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your interest in regenerative medicine? Hi there, I'm Andy Armitage and I work at Greenside Veterinary Practice based in the Scottish Borders and I've been doing regenerative medicine now for a good 10 years and uh, I've been treating a lot of different uh, musculoskeletal conditions in, in dogs mainly but also also in cats and I was uh, the first person to open up a, a dedicated Regenerative Medicine Rehabilitation Centre, uh, referral centre in, in the UK. And I've recently published some of my work um, regarding regenerative medicine and chronic musculoskeletal disorders in a peer-reviewed uh, journal, which is brilliant. It's something, a, a subject that is lacking in the literature, showing uh, the, the you know amazing effects that we're seeing with regenerative therapies. Yeah, we, I'm so excited to chat about it. So we're going to dive deep into that. Um, today, we're going to be chatting about gracilis contractures and this is a condition which you've treated using your genitive medicine but before we chat about that won't you just um, explain to us exactly what a gracilis contracture is how it's formed and how you diagnose it okay well gracilis contracture is quite a, a challenging condition because normally by the time the the patient presents with uh, clinical signs the disease process is is quite advanced so it causes a, a very characteristic gait in in the in the dog and once you have, have seen this this gait it's it's quite classic for for the condition so once you see changes to the gait, we have a lot of damage to, to, the, to the muscle. So that has implications for, for treatment, which we'll go through later. So the, the condition is, is a problem with the muscle. The, the gracilis muscle becomes contracted and fibrotic and the normal muscle fibers are replaced by a lot of fibrosis and scar tissue. And that causes dysfunction to the muscle and shortening of the muscle. And uh, also you can get 
you know, tendon issues as well of the, the gracilis tendon, tendinopathies. And this results in a, yeah, a, a, a gait abnormality because the, the, the stifle and the, the hip cannot flex and extend as, as it should do. So we get this classic gait abnormality where the, the hock sort of flicks out in an elastic sort of recoil as they go through the flight arc. So there's, I guess it's a, it's not a, a common condition, but it's it, we tend to see it in German shepherd dogs, but uh, not exclusively. Certainly other breeds and shepherd related breeds are more predisposed, but we can also see it in, in greyhounds and other breeds as well. And we don't really know what, what causes it. Um, there's been a lot of different things that have been postulated as, as, uh, as a cause of gracilis contracture, but... Uh, I guess, yeah, the jury is still out and, and, you know, it's probably multifactorial and, uh, and can be different causes in, in, in different animals. But there's been, yeah, repetitive strain injury is probably, you know, the most common cause because um, we certainly see this in, in German shepherds that are, are very active or, you know, in working dogs or agility um, type dogs. It's certainly a lot more co common. So repetitive strain type Type injuries could be, you know, a primary cause of the muscle damage, but there must be other things going on as well, because, you know, if a muscle is damaged, they have a very good blood supply and tend to heal very well on their own. But if this is a repetitive type type damage, we are going to get some fibrotic change. And But it really seems to um, wind up in, in the gracilis in these cases, and we get extensive fibrosis and, and contracture. There's been other potential mechanisms, um, certainly, you know, muscle tears do happen and that can result in, in fibrotic contracture and other causes potentially uh, neurological involving the neurological supply to the muscle have been, you know, uh, potentially proposed as, as causes, inflammatory conditions, sort of immune mediated problems, potentially like a myositis, a focal myositis and uh, vascular issues as well, things affecting the, uh, the, the blood supply. So there's been a lot of different, yeah, you know, potential causes and, you know, is going to vary case to case. But um, I think, yeah, the most, the most common is, is, is a repetitive strain type problem. But I think there probably is a genetic predisposition because we see it, you know, um, far more commonly in, in, in the German shepherd type breeds of dog. Are there any other muscles that you see this type of contracture in? Well, you can see it in the semimembranosis and tendinosis, you know, that sit next to the gracilis and, and those can be um, involved in, in the process. And, you know, we see other like infraspinatus contracture um, and, uh, you know, so it does occur in other other muscles it's just it's just weird how one muscle can you know be affected and you know others aren't so you know masticatory myositis is another thing in the um, masticatory muscles uh, where we see a, a focal inflammatory change in in the muscle and muscle loss and fibrosis so yeah, it's not just seen in, in the gracilis. What I can't get my head around is if it affects one muscle, why doesn't it affect them all? So there's there's factors there that we don't understand still. Yeah, so there's some more research for you to do. <laughs> <laughs> Find out why, Definitely. what's causing it. Yes. So, you know, your interest in regenerative medicine started before really you were treating these kind of conditions. So you obviously, you're interested in regenerative medicine, and then you started to see in, in treating more and more of these type of conditions. What are the general ways which most um, rehab and vets would have treated these type of contractures before regenerative medicine was around? So there's been a lot of different treatments proposed for gracilis contracture. And I must say, up until now, really none of them have been effective. So, you know, con conservative management using in the early stages where there's pain and inflammation, you know, non-steroidals and uh, painkillers, and then physical therapies such as, you know, massage and uh, dry needling and uh, home exercises and 
hydrotherapy and things like that, physiotherapy to treat this. There has been surgical options employed where you cut the gracilis tendon um, or transect the muscle or even remove the whole gracilis muscle and tendon. These surgical options have short-term benefits, but what happens is is very quickly within months, you know, that fibrosis reforms. Even if you take out the whole muscle, um, the whole gracilis muscle, you tend to then get changes in the fascia and surrounding tissue, uh, contracture of, of that and scar tissue and, and the semimembranosis and the tendinosis become affected and you get back to square one where you've got the same clinical signs and and the gait uh, the abnormal gait returns so surgeries you know in the medium to long term is is not an option and does nothing for long-term term benefit um so you know we tend not to do that now and other treatments being proposed are uh, platelet-rich plasma, which is a, a regenerative therapy. And I think that does have some use in the, in the very early stages of um, gracilis contracture, where you've got a lot of inflammation potentially going on, and PRP would be indicated um, for that. But as I said earlier... Normally, by the time we see these cases, you know, we've got quite advanced changes in the muscle. And um, it's really what we've got to try and get the treatments to remove this fibrosis. And PRP on its own is not going to do that. I have seen one case treated with collagenase, which is an enzyme that digests collagen uh, injected into the gracilis muscle. And yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, <laughs> it was quite horrendous. Basically, it just digests the muscle. And uh, yeah, it wasn't particularly effective. So that has been tried as well. Shockwave has been used as well. Um, and that is actually part of my, my treatment. I use that alongside regenerative um, therapies. And uh, if we use shockwave treatment, I think, you know, that helps to stimulate the the muscle and potentially sort of break up the fibrosis at a cellular level and that in combination with um, physical therapies can be can be helpful and it well we haven't got the published data but it probably does slow the progression um, of it but um, it's certainly not on its own curative or prevents the um, or reverses the gait abnormalities that that you see but I think yeah it's um, certainly helpful yeah because of the uh, well lack of treatment efficacy efficacy in, in 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 treating this condition you know we've been looking for other other treatment options and it's it's something that I thought regenerative medicine was a good yeah a good approach and uh, certainly we've been getting some really really encouraging results using sort of a multimodal approach yeah so tell us about your first case that you used stem cell treatments with so um, my first case was a Belgium shepherd that was a, a working dog, worked in uh, sheep trials and uh, had developed uh, a lameness in the, in the back end and uh, was having trouble uh, exercising. And obviously the, uh, the, the gait abnormalities were quite obvious to the owner and she had explored uh, several options and was currently having physiotherapy and hydrotherapy and the, the dog wasn't really um, progressing. So she was looking into uh, other options and, uh, and found me and traveled all the way up from uh, Devon to the Scottish borders to, uh, to see me. So as with any treatment using regenerative therapies, it's, it's really important to have a holistic diagnosis. So I don't mean using homeopathy. I mean, looking at the animal as a whole and, uh, and, and treating the animal as a, as a, as a whole. And it's very unusual to have just one, one condition in a dog. I mean, there's obviously lots of compensatory issues um, going on when you have a, a, a unilateral lameness. And, um, and it's important if we're going to treat with regenerative medicine, because it's a very targeted approach, you know, we need to, if there's a problem with the joint, we need to put it in the joint. If it's a tendon, we need to put it in the tendon. Um, if it's in the spine, it goes in the spine. You know, it, it, it's a very targeted treatment. So we have to identify all areas of 
musculoskeletal pathology, the primary issues, the compensatory issues. So we always do, you know, full, obviously, orthopedic physical examination, neurological examination, and then further diagnostics as, as required. So this dog um, had a had a, a an, an obvious gracilis contracture. I could see that from from the the, the dog walking, and uh, on physical examination, it's quite easy to pick up as well by feeling the the gracilis muscle. I could feel on on one side it was thickened uh, and wider than it should be, and had a it should, you know the gracilis muscle should be nice and squidgy and and smooth, and I could feel it was you know hard hard and nodular and gracilis tendon was was enlarged as well but this dog also had some pain in its hips and and lower spine as well so we got it in for some further diagnostics we german shepherds are predisposed to things like hip dysplasia and and uh, lumbar sacral disease so we had to rule that out and uh, and i wanted to ultrasound the gracilis to confirm you know what we were we were seeing um and uh, get a true extent of what was happening so we took some x-rays of the spine and and the dog had uh, a extra lumbar vertebrae so it had eight lumbar vertebrae and and this was sacralized on one side so this vertebrae lumbar vertebrae couldn't decide whether it was a uh, a lumbar vertebrae or a ster or a um or a sacrum and it was sort of halfway in between so we had this deformity at the lumbar sacral junction and the dog also had some hip arthritis as well secondary to hip dysplasia and then we ultrasounded the uh the gracilis and we could see you know enlargement of the the muscle and replacement of the the muscle fibers with with scar tissue or this fibrotic change and it also had a tendinopathy as well so i thought it was a a good case to try alternative medicine on and we had to harvest fat to grow the stem cells so i use what's called autologous mesenchymal stem cells which are derived from fat so we take a small fat sample, which is from a umbilical, just an incision just above the umbilicus, um, and we take the falciform fat, and we only need a small amount, about a, a teaspoonful, and we can send that off to the lab that's um, based down in Coventry, and they then grow up the, the stem cells from the fat. So they basically liquidize the fat and release the stem cells and put those into culture and culture up the stem cells into a concentration that you know uh, they make make me what i asked for you know how many cells in required volume and then they uh, send that back to me cry gently frozen uh, in dry ice so i then store those stem cells at the um at the practice we've got a minus 80 freezer where we store the stem cells until they're needed. So that culture process takes about four weeks. So we got the dog back four weeks later and we defrosted those stem cells and we made some platelet-rich plasma and combined the stem cells and platelet-rich plasma together. And first of all, we injected the both hips to treat the arthritis and we put stem cells into the lumbar sacral junction as well, into the epidural space to treat the lumbar sacral disease. Um, I must say, we're not trying to regrow a new spine here. All we're doing is, is treating the disc disease and the, the changes that have occurred because of the, the deformity. And uh, then we did shockwave therapy using um, the pulse vet shockwave, which is one of the only um, shockwave devices that produces a, a, a true shockwave and that is a electro hydraulic system um, and a focused shockwave system. So we shockwave the gracilis muscle and, uh, and tendon, and then we used ultrasound to guide our stem cells and, and platelet rich plasma combined together into the, the lesions in the, the muscle and tendon. And I think it's really important to, to use musculoskeletal ultrasound so that we can actually visualize where we're where we're putting these treatments as i said it's a very targeted approach and we need to to visualize that and really focus in on on those areas that are causing a problem so we did that and then we 
we basically rested the animal for a couple of weeks after that. And then we started some physiotherapy, doing some stretching exercises. And, and then about, it was about 12 weeks later, we did a second treatment. Um, so we'd seen a lot of improvements in, um, I've got false plate analysis at, at work and we, we were seeing increases in stride length and the range of motion in stifle and hip was improving. Uh, the gait abnormality was um, improving, but there was still some some thickening, still some residual scar tissue. So we did uh, a second treatment with, with shockwave therapy. And then we did, uh, again, ultrasound guided injections of stem cells and PRP, rest uh, the dog again for a couple of weeks. And then we really started with some intense physio stretching exercises and massage uh, and then straight into hydrotherapy and really push the dog and yeah I saw it six weeks after that about 18 weeks after its initial treatment and its gait was perfectly normal its range of motion in the stifle and hip was normal it had lost that classic flick of the um the hock and the owner was over the moon because you know the dog was yeah doing so well progressing really well in 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 hydrotherapy and that was yeah several years ago now and the the dog to this day maintains you know it's it just won a, a big uh in the sheepdog trials out in Germany, I think it uh, won a uh, uh, major award out there. So, you know, it's back to normal and it stayed normal. So that was that was the first case um, that I treated using combination therapies. And uh, yeah, the results uh, yeah blew me away because there's nothing else out there that can can do that. Yeah, I mean, wow. Like I've treated a few of these <coughs> and they are so frustrating because you sometimes feel like you're getting somewhere and then two weeks later you feel like you're just back to square one again yeah and it really depends on what the owner's doing i mean i used to do treatments with acupuncture and you know physio treatments and hydrotherapy underwater treadmill and i used to find that they used to show some slight improvement but never like recovering their gait um when yeah. i say slight improvements some improvements in their mobility and the ability for them to move around with the hydrotherapy. And then as soon as they stopped the treatment, it would just come back, back to exactly where it was. So this, these are amazing, amazing results that you've got. And so how many cases um, have you treated since then? So I've treated, I don't know, probably somewhere about 15 cases and all with yeah similar oh. responses. I think, you know, if you could get in there, early that is the best you know before you start getting gait changes and you're going to get you're going to get a much quicker treatment response but um unfortunately as i said earlier you know you never see these cases until they're advanced so you know you have to hit them really hard and you have to use a lot of different therapies together to get the um to get the results but i think yeah we we can measure the effectiveness of the treatment using we do a lot of goniometry looking at joint range of motion and we've got uh, false plate analysis at work where we can look at stride length and things like that and then also musculoskeletal ultrasound which is so important to monitor treatment responses and actually see the regeneration in the tissues you know what we're seeing is removal of fibrosis and scar tissue and, and restoration of normal muscle fibers and things and that's why i think you know physical therapies are, are great but as soon as you stop doing them as you say you know all you're doing is you're you're stretching out that fibrotic tissue and you're getting you know gains with that but as soon as you stop doing that intense um rehab you know things just contract up again so you need to really focus on that that scar tissue and 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 remove it and so surgery is not the way because it just causes more damage and more scar tissue formation so i think yeah using is it, I, I have used just stem cells and um, and PRP. Well, I've used stem cells on their own. I've used PRP on its own. I've used shockwave on its own, and I've used a combination. And I'd say the combination is is key. And you know, it makes sense. I I feel the the shockwave. How I like to think of it is the shockwave makes the 
sort of breaks up the scar tissue at a sort of microscopic level and um, stimulates a, an inflammatory response that you can then use the, the stem cells to remove the fibrosis. Stem cells are uh, awesome at uh, reversing fibrotic change scar tissue. And, you know, we've seen that in, we treat a lot of supraspinatus tendinopathies and biceps tendinopathies. And stem cells can even remove mineralization. You know, we, we do a lot of work with supraspinatus tendinopathy and it's quite common to see mineralization of the tendon in thesis and stem cells can reverse that you know take away that mineralization as well as the the fibrosis so you know earlier treatments using just prp is good for its anti-inflammatory effect but it hasn't got that anti-fibrotic effect so the prp in combination with the stem cells the prp provides all these growth factors and and it stimulates a blood supply as well which scar tissue just doesn't have so i think breaking up the 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 fibrosis at a, a microscopic level with the the shock wave and stimulating an, an inflammatory response and then injecting the prp that's going to cause neovascularization new blood vessel formation um and it provides a sort of scaffold for the for the stem cells because it um, causes a clot a fibrin clot basically um, that the stem cells love and the prp also attracts stem cells and keeps them in the the targeted area so we can inject the stem cells and they will sit in the tissue in that fibrin clot and and talk to other cell types and mediate the the healing response so we use all all of those techniques together and then physical therapies are so important afterwards because once we've removed that fibrosis we need to stretch out the muscle and align the fibers and um, especially in the tendon as well just get all that nice new collagen aligned and um, stretch it out and then you know, you, you will get long-term benefits there. Anything that doesn't remove the fibrosis, you're, it's going to be a losing battle. Yeah, so that's the secret to it, actually removing that fibrosis. Yeah. Cutting it out just doesn't have the same response. We've seen that. I've seen a few, I think I had two or three cases when I had my clinic that had surgery. And yeah, they just, it was a few, four to six weeks and they were back. Yeah. We're yeah. back to square one. It's hopeful, but yeah, you know, we never really saw saw any improvements long term. And you obviously your clinic is a regenerative medicine clinic and rehabilitation. What are the other types of cases that you're seeing um, and that are being referred to you? And are you using that PRP stem cell and shockwave combination in all of them, or is it only the cases that have um, fibrotic issues in their muscles? So we see all types of musculoskeletal conditions. We, yeah, arthritis is a big one, but we see probably the, the most common condition is elbow dysplasia. And that's a whole other subject. Uh, uh, we should do another uh, podcast on. We definitely uh, should. <laughs> so I see probably 70% of my cases are Labradors and uh you know, elbow dysplasia seems to be a very, very common condition nowadays. So I, um, yeah, I use stem cells and PRP to, to treat and manage arthritis. And as I was saying earlier, you know, we have a very much uh, holistic approach. So arthritis is not just a, a condition that affects uh, the joint. You know, we get loss of range of motion and we get muscle and tendon involvement too. As with elbow dysplasia, it's really, really common to to get uh, concurrent shoulder uh, tendinopathies. And I'd say probably 85% of dogs with elbow dysplasia will have shoulder tendinopathies. They're just not diagnosed because people aren't doing musculoskeletal ultrasound. So for combination therapies, I always use PRP and stem cells together because they work synergistically and they both have have benefits that that you know um, you get better responses using two modalities together. I will only add in shockwave if there's yeah mineralization or extensive fibrosis. So you know for tendons, especially supraspinatus tendons, um, we'll add in the shockwave. Sometimes iliopsoas. That's a, another really common um, problem that we treat where you've got mineralization of the the distal tendon. I will use shockwave 
immediately prior to putting in um, PRP and, and, and the stem cells. For, for general arthritis, I use, yeah, just PRP and stem cells on, on their own. Yeah, so interesting. I definitely love to chat to you about the albatus pedia because that's another, you know, a condition that is so tricky for us to treat. You know, the response that we get, some, some respond well, others not so well. And our outcomes are not great with those. So we'll definitely mm. have to book, book that as another podcast interview. And, you know, elbow displays is another condition where surgeries not always the best option and I'm quite controversial in in my approach where I don't recommend surgical intervention I much prefer to go in there with regenerative medicine as a first line of treatment but uh, yeah that's a whole other story so before we finish let's quickly chat about the study that you did so it's obviously it's your first peer-reviewed study that you have published so congratulations on that and I had a quick look through it and it is so much work and so in depth. And as I was looking through, I was like, whoa, this is just the, the amount of content that you have to and research that you have to do to write um, something like that. Um, so I really commend you. I know it was you and there were some other other colleagues of yours involved too. So yeah, well done to all of you. What you. made you decide to to go ahead and, and do that? I mean, after how many cases you'd obviously treated, you thought, no, like I need to do something. I need to publish something. Well, when I first started doing regenerative medicine, I couldn't quite believe the changes that I was seeing. And I was like, I need a way of measuring these changes so that I can convince myself they're actually happening because I was seeing these miraculous changes um, in joint range of motion and, um, you know, the animal's quality of life and pain state. And and you start thinking, am I, am I making this up? They can't, they can't be this good. You know, I'm sure last time, you know, before treatment, I couldn't bend that elbow very much. And now it bends more. So um, very early on, I, I started, I was like, right, this is a new technology. We need to start collecting some some data so that we can actually measure these treatment responses. So uh, I started using stance analysis, looking at weight distribution and goniometry and gulic muscle measurements and pressure algometry for lumbar sacral junction things. So I had these objective measures and then I tried lots of different uh, questionnaires um, like the load and Helsinki pain questionnaires for the owners and And over time, I realized that they weren't quite what I wanted. And I started some work with uh, Vetmetrica, which is a a health related quality of life um, online questionnaire. And and that seemed to work really well with uh, with my owners. They could complete that quite nicely. So we started generating lots of uh, lots of data. And yeah, we were seeing increases in range of motion in joints by, you know, 30, 40 degrees after treatment which is amazing and uh, so then I started thinking right I've got to publish this so so we uh, collated uh, yeah all the data from the the clinical record and then and then yeah wrote the paper but uh, it's yeah it's there's 250 dogs there I think I've current count is nearly 700 dogs I've treated with regenerative medicine so and it's taken me a couple of years to write this paper so we've got you know we've got a lot more cases and I'm gonna yeah write some more more papers using that data and and data that we've collected uh, since then but sort of focus it more I really want to write a paper on elbow displays here because I think there's um there's some really nice treatment responses with regenerative medicine and uh, that outperform any surgical options. So I think that's important to, to get out there. So started working on that. Well, I just want to say well done and I want to say thank you. So because people like you are what we need to be publishing all your findings and, you know, for being the person who is trying things. Um, so we need we need more vets like you trying Try something, give it a go, and then find something that actually works and then let us all know about it. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. Awesome, Andy. Thanks so much for your time. It's been wonderful chatting to you and I look forward to chatting to you about Albert Asperger. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for having me. Cheers, Andrew. Cheers. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. Don't forget to bookmark the next Vet Rehab Summit on Saturday, the 4th of November. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference created specifically for you, the Vet Rehab community. Online Pet Health members get VIP complimentary access to the Vet Rehab Summit. For more information about continued education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepethealth.com.